Hallelujah. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the first chapter of uh, Matthew. We'll go there in just a few moments. Um, we want to talk this morning about a father. One of the biblical fathers who's often overlooked is just a side thought and a side character in, in the events of the Bible and the events of Scripture. Um, his wife gains great pre pre uh, preeminence in Scripture. Um, in, in the Catholic Church, she's worshipped as, as, as the highest matron saint there is. And, um, and that is Mary. She, she is looked at as the greatest woman of the Bible. And all she was was a virgin who would do what God told her to do. You understand sometimes we, we, over, we, over, we overdo things. That she, just was, she was just a, 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 a devout, faithful virgin who obeyed God and, uh, got, and was used of God. Hallelujah. And so God, God did choose Mary to bring Jesus into the earth through the uh, virgin birth. Through, through uh, a virgin who had not known a man. And the Bible tells us he, she did not know a man until after Jesus was born. Um, and then she conceived other children, James and John and brothers and sisters and so forth. And, uh, but you know what? Even in, Jesus, even in God choosing Mary to be the natural fa uh, mother of Jesus, in other words, giving, giving him flesh, the, the, the Word took on flesh. John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father. And that came because, because in Mary's womb, she gave Him flesh. But God also had a father for Jesus, albeit a stepfather. Joseph raised Jesus as his own son, watched over him, taught him his trade. We know Jesus was a carpenter. Joseph was a carpenter. He, he, he mentored Jesus. He taught Jesus uh, how to make a living, you know. Well, he didn't need to make a living. He was the son of God. Now, listen, I know you've seen the, you may have seen the old movie that was out a number of years ago, put out by the Mormons, uh, you know, uh, talking about the missing years of Jesus from 12 to 30. And, of course, he was going around making clay pigeons live and, you know, and, and translocating all over the world. None of that's true. He grew up in Nazareth. The Bible says that he went to Nazareth where he grew up. He, went, he, didn't, he wasn't in Australia. He wasn't in South America. He wasn't in caravans. He wasn't forming clay pigeons out of the ground and breathing on them and making them live. That's just hogwash. That's just hogwash. Tommy Rot, bunk, baloney. And that's about all the words you can use as a Christian and get away with it. But anything else you can decide besides descriptive of, of junk, that's what it is. Hallelujah. No, Jesus grew up under the mentorship. I want to talk a little bit this morning about the, the, the role of fathers. We, we are, our fatherhood is under attack. Amen. Men have been emasculated by postmodernism. Men, and, and, you know, the, the, the feminist movement of postmodernism. Listen, listen, yeah, listen, I believe women should, you know, women are, are, are not under our feet. Women are not uh, dogs. They're not, you know, house slaves. Women, women were given by God as a helpmate to stand beside us, not under us. I understand that. We listen. We believe, and we believe that women are the handmaidens of the Lord. They're blessed of God. I, I, I get all that. But this garbage of men, be, women being men, and men being women, and women taking men roles, and men, men taking women roles, and all this stupid mess is ungodly, and it's not of God. And it has emasculated men. Yeah. Men don't know how to be men anymore. Right. Men don't know how to 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 be the head of the house and be a man. Amen. They got to be a woman. You know, they got to let the, you know, the, the, they, they do everything and they got to, they got to, and, and in society and in the public workplace, they, you know, they got to be emasculated. They got to, they got to be sensitive and they got to be this and they got to be that. They can't be men anymore. I was listening to the kids tell me, somebody in church was telling a story about their, their child uh, made a, um, made a knife, whittled a knife, took it to school. Oh, they were in trouble. They're a little elementary kid. They're in trouble. Call in the counselors. Why did you bring this weapon to school? That's what boys do. Right. Boys have knives. The first thing they want when they're young is a pocket knife. They got to have a knife. They got to whittle. They got to do stuff. They play army with sticks. You, you can't, oh, we got to do away with toy guns. It doesn't matter. They go back to what they used to do. They'll get a stick and then it'll be a machine gun. Yeah. So true. So true. And if you can't give them a stick, they'll use their fingers. Pow, 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 pow. It's what boys do. Yeah. But you can't do that anymore. We got to let them play with Barbies. <laughs> they got to be sensitive and play with their Barbies. Give me a stinking break. 
I mean, I remember we used to walk around, I mean, somebody would throw a fake hand grenade and go, boom, and you jump and like you just got blown up. Yeah. Can't do that anymore. That's, that's teaching violence. We're teaching violence. There, there's been the emasculation of the male. But I'm telling you, Christian men ought to be men. Amen. Are you here? Stand up and be a man. I'm telling you right now, give the guy in Texas a medal. Yeah. Yeah. Found some guy molesting his four-year-old daughter. He choked him and killed him. Didn't mean to, just went off on him. He didn't stop and say, you're just misunderstood. You need therapy. He gave him therapy. Hello? He laid hands on him. Hard, fast, and continuously. Oh, man, that's just mean. Listen, what would you do if your four-year-old daughter was being molested by a grown man? Now, postmodernists and liberals all sit around and go, they're just under misunderstood. They were injured as a child, and they need, they need counseling. I'll counsel them. The pastor, you're a preacher. Yeah, Jesus ran the money changers out of the temple. That's no, there's no wimpy Jesus in the, in, in the Bible. That's right. I mean, he ran the whole crew out by himself. Are you here? We, you, you know, you, we see too much art of Jesus. The little effeminate Jesus. Hello? Effeminate people don't run money changers out of the temple by themselves. That's right, please leave. We shouldn't be doing this in the house of God. He didn't ask him, please leave. Uh-uh, go ahead. <clears throat> he said, my house should be a house of prayer, not a den of thieves. You made a den of thieves and whooped them. Yeah. yeah. Go, Jesus. Go, Jesus. Yeah, all right. But it's, it's, it's this emasculation of, of men. And then I can't speak to all the world, but Christian men. <clears throat> Did you know that the guys who first, the first disciples of Jesus, the first disciples of Jesus were not weenies? Amen. Hello? Think about who they were. They were fishermen. They're tax collectors. You better be tough if you're a tax collector. I mean, they're going to whoop you before they give you the money. I mean, he had a rough, tough month. Peter, the night that Jesus was betrayed, cut some guy's ear off. He's ready to fight him to the death. Hello. So, fatherhood has been under attack. Masculinity has been under attack. God has a plan for fathers to be mentors, to be gods, to be men in front of their children and in the church. Listen, understand this. The purpose, one of the, one of the purpose, now the said the church is the gathering place of the saints, but one of the things that should happen in the church is that the fatherless should have role models that they come and are mentored by just by seeing them in action. Amen. Amen. If the kids are fatherless, have no fear. The church has men in it, should have men in it Amen. that they can look up to. And say that's what a man is supposed to be like. Amen. And, can, and they can love on those kids and, and, and be there for those kids to be mentors to them. Amen? Amen? So God saw the role of fathers as important. Amen? He, when he said and gave this, this, this uh, responsibility to Joseph, he was saying the role of a father, even in the role of a stepfather, is important to mentor and to train and to be there for children. They need fathers. They need men, men that are fathers and fathers that are men. Amen. Amen. That kids need that. They need the guidance of that mentor, father figure in their life. You know, one of the, one of the main crises in the black community for years has been the lack of fathers. Amen. Right. Kids are growing up without daddies and no one in the community to be a mentor. But God says it's important to have that mentorship. God says it's important to have that example. Amen. And that's why in the church, bring your kids into the church. Let them see men who are men. Amen. Pastor Ed's a man. Amen. Ain't no wimp here. Right, Hello. Okay. Amen. That's right. Right on. Praise God. I know my voice cracked until I was 51, but that's okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
yeah, man, see, anyone can conceive a child. But there's a godly role that God has for men to mentor and to train those children. Amen. To raise them and to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. To be godly examples to them. Amen. So, single parents, the church is for you. Listen, if you're a father with child, children, the church is for you because there's a nurturing there. From the women in the church. The church should be fulfilling that. Listen, you can't do it with, in society with counseling. And he counseled him. I mean, they sat there and, you know, with this kid and counseled him and, and, he's, and all this kind of crazy stuff. And, and, the, and the person counseling him was getting more help than the kid did. He didn't need help. He's a kid. Okay. School policies, you can't bring this. Don't bring it. Do it again. I understand you're a kid. Go. That's it. We don't, we don't allow that in school. There's, there's, there's safety issues there. You know, I understand. You thought it was cool, you know, playing with a knife. <laughs> Go play army. Put Ken away and go play army. You know Barbie and Ken? So just as God looked for a godly young woman to, rate, to, to bring Jesus into the world and to train him and to be a nurturer, he looked for a godly man to be the father example, his naturally fa natural father example to Jesus. Verse 18 of Matthew 1, now on the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came to him, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then uh, Joseph, her husband, being a just man. Now understand under, under the Jewish system, they, what, they, they were husband, but they weren't, had not consummated the marriage. They hadn't had sex. Amen. All right? They were engaged, or there was a year, about a year period of being engaged, but they were considered husband and wife where they were engaged, and then after that they actually had the consummation and uh, became fully my husband and wife. But they, in other words, you couldn't be with anybody else, you couldn't date anybody else, you couldn't have your bachelor or bachelorette party. Amen. That's the world. Amen. I said, that's the world. You're one last fling. What do you mean you're one last fling? You shouldn't have any flings. I've already done that. God will forgive you. But we shouldn't promote it. Amen. Listen, our mistakes should not be promoted as, as normal. Amen. We should recognize it was what they were. They were wrong. They were mistakes. We shouldn't have done it. We, if we did do it, God forgave us. Right. But you don't promote it as normal. That's right. Hello. Oh, they're all right. It's out, they're boys, he's out sowing the wild oats. Well, get rid of the wild oats. You don't need them. Amen. Hello. Amen. That's just garbage. Amen. Hello. Yeah, we've all made mistakes. I'm not saying we had, we're perfect and we hadn't made mistakes. But we shouldn't promote it. Hello? If you were doing drugs, once you shouldn't tell people, oh, you, do drugs. you ought to do some drugs at least once so you know what it's like. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> you ought to do some crack just one time to see what it's like. No, you shouldn't. It could kill you the first time. Crack is, is, is horrible. I mean, it, it's, it, it can be instantly addictive and it can kill you the first time you take it. Not a, well, I know some people who didn't. Well, you know, do you want to be a Russian roulette? Amen. Drugs, drugs are not good for you. Hello. Amen. All right. So she's being found with child. Then her husband, Joseph, remember he's really engaged. Being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived of her is the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, that it might fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took his wife, took to him his wife, and did not know her, in the biblical sense, till she had brought first, forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Um, Matthew 2, 13, we have an instance where uh, they're told to, fly, to flee into Egypt. And then in Matthew 2, 19, it says that when Herod was dead, they were told to take the child to Nazareth where he was brought up. So, this is what we know about these, these three passages, Matthew 2 and Matthew, uh, Matthew 1. is about all we know about Joseph from the Bible. There's not a lot said. Then we see remnants of stuff later on. You know, is this not J Joseph's son, Joseph and Mary's son, the carpenter? You know, here's brothers and sisters are with us. So we know that. Um, 
we, we know, you know, that there's remnants of his, his influence, but somewhere in those eight, in, in those years between the time Jesus was born and the time that, well, actually between 12, because he was with his father and mother at the temple, between 12 and 30, there's no account of what, anything that happened to Joseph. We don't know what happened to Joseph, uh, but we see the results of Joseph being in Jesus' life. Okay? First of all, we know this about Joseph. He had to be a loving man. Why? Under Hebrew law, for Mary to have been pregnant during their betrothal, betrothal, their engagement, I was trying to be fancy, during their engagement was, pen, was punishable by stoning. He could have taken her out and said, I have not had sex with her. She's pregnant. Stone her. And I'm going to tell you, there were some Jews that were willing to accommodate. Them, them people loved the stone. They were good stoners. I'm telling you. I mean, remember when the woman was called adultery in the very act? Yeah. They were going to stone her. What about the dude that was with her? He was one of them. He's probably one of the, sort of the religious leaders of the day. That's why they, they let him go. That's the same thing happens in politics today. Are you here? Think about it. Mono Lewinsky is a, is, is, a, uh, is a joke, and Bill Clinton is a hero. He was caught in the act. Hello? Think about our society elevates him to, you know, almost godhood as a great this and great that. And she's now a buzzword. She's a joke for a buzzword. A buzzword for a joke. Yeah. Are you here? That's right. Double standard. Yeah. Same thing happened back here. The woman was caught. What about the man? If you're caught in the very act, the man had to be there. Amen. They let him go and brought her to be stoned. And they all picked up rocks and were getting ready to take her out. Until Jesus wrote some stuff in the ground. Hello? So Joseph had the right to have her stone for being pregnant outside of their marriage. And so what does he, what's the first thing he does when he finds out she's pregnant? He's looking, he's not angry, he's not, we have no, no sign that he's angry or bitter. He looks for a way to secretly or privately put her away. In other words, have her in turn and break off the engagement, but not put her to public display and shame and, 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 and disgrace. Right. That's love. I said, that's love. Every right to have her killed for breaking that marriage, breaking up their, their, their vows and so forth, uh, at least the way he looks like to him, we, we understand it's the Holy Spirit, but he had the right to do it, but he's pondering how, how can I secretly, privately allow her not to be disgraced and be shamed and yet break off the engagement because I can't marry her now. She's, she's broken the vows we had. What, what compassion for her? Amen. I said, what compassion for her? Amen. Um, so then God speaks to him by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. So we know that he was loving towards his wife. One of the most, uh, Donald David o, o. McKay says this. He said, the most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. To let them see their father love their mother. Amen. Amen. You can be affectionate to your wife. Man, you need to be affectionate. Oh, listen. You ain't got to make out in the kitchen. <laughs> but affection is more than making out. Come on, guys. Look, we're all old enough to hear these things. If you're over 13, you need to be hearing this. Amen. If you're a young man, you need to be hearing this. Affection is more than making out. It's, it's, it's how you treat your wife. It's how you, you take care of her. If you're tender towards her or if, if you treat her like a dog. Woman, do what I say do. I slap you myself if I hear you say that. Yeah. I'm the shepherd. I'll whoop you, sheep, in the, right in the line. You want, your wife's not a dog. Amen. Your kids need to see you treating your wife with respect. Amen. My wife's dumb. What's that say about you? Amen. You got to be dumb to put up with you? My wife, my wife is, you know, my wife don't know what's coming in, which end's going, which end's coming. Your wife's smarter than you think. Hello? Amen. She's God in your house. She's raising your children. 
Hello? Amen. Your wife needs to be treated with respect. She needs to be treated with honor. She needs to be treated with dignity. She needs to be, uh, you need to be affectionate. Your terms need to be kind towards her. Amen. Your kids don't need to hear you calling your wife stupid. Right. You don't need to cussing your wife out. That's right. In private or in public. Amen. I'll slap you again. You don't need to, that's, that's wrong. Amen. You don't come home and cuss her out because you had a bad day at work. Right. Shouldn't be cussing in the first place as a Christian. Amen. But real men, uh, it's easy to cuss, uh, cuss out and hit a woman. That takes no effort at all. Even if they're mouthy like Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, Shannon, my daughter, my second daughter. She thinks she can take the world. I had a self-defense class. <laughs> she pulls that on Nathan. He just picks her up and walks around with her. Throws her over the shoulder and walks around with her. You know, it's like, Shannon, he can take you, honey. Yeah. And no matter how much you say you're tough, Nathan can put you down in two seconds flat. Where is Shannon? Yeah, where is she? <laughs> She's probably off when the classroom's helping. Yeah, Nathan just goes and grabs her, throws her over the shoulder, walks around with her. Okay? So even if you've got a mouthy wife, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort for a man to take her down. Okay, any man could do that. Your, your children need to see you restrained. Yeah, listen, it's time you got to restrain yourself. But anybody could, I mean, any man could go punch a woman. That just say, go, go punch somebody your own size. Yeah, right. Hello? See how that works out for you, pal. No. Your wife should be the jewel of your household. Mm -hmm. your, your sons are only, listen, men, your sons are only going to know how to treat a woman by how you treat your wife. Men, your daughters are only going to know how to be treated by how you treat your wife. If one, girls grow up in a house where the husband beats the wife, that's what they're going to be looking for in marriage. They're going to think it's normal in a marriage. Men, be loving towards your wife. Be an example to your children. They are going to learn from you. I said, they are going to learn from you how to treat a woman or how to be treated by a man. We got I, the, the, the silence, the air that was sucked out of the room when people went, <gasps> lowered the air pressure here by, by, by 10 millibars. I'm telling you, men, you are the example. Joseph is an example of a loving father. Amen of a loving husband. And it takes, listen, it's going to take effort. Something. There's going to be times when there's pressure on you from out at work. There's going to be pressure in the house. There's going to be stuff going on. But you have to be the leader and walk in love and be a loving example of what it's like to be a godly father and husband in your households. Amen. Amen. Households without fathers. Men in our church, you need to be examples. When, they, when these kids come into the church whose fathers are not in the homes, they need to see how you treat your wife that is godly. Amen. That you're not out in the parking lot arguing in the car when they drive up. <laughs> Hello. And then you get out and walk in as soon as you hit the front door. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How's everything today? Smiling. It's all good. <laughs> then get back out in the car and fight. Pick up right where you left off. I know a pastor that did that. Him and his wife would argue all the way to church, pull in the parking lot, stop arguing, walk in, he'd preach, she'd play the piano. They'd get back out, go back out and get in the car and start the argument over. Then they outgrew that and they got over that, thank God. And, and they've had a successful marriage and ministry for a number of years. But in their young days, boy, they, they were having, it was tough. I don't know how he preached. It's hard to be mad with your wife and preach. Hello? It's hard to have your wife mad with you and preach. So Joseph was, Joseph was loving towards his wife. He was loving towards his children. When Jesus came along, uh, the child that he had not conceived, we don't see an attitude of, he's not my flesh and blood. When Jesus was lost at the temple, he was looking just as hard as Mary for their, for their son. Remember? He wasn't really lost. They were lost to them. 
He protected them from the hatred of Herod. He nurtured and cared for him. He taught him his trade of carpentry. We know Jesus was a carpenter. And the one he adopted was the one that the rest of the world rejected. So Joseph paid the price to be the father of Jesus. He had to move around. He had to keep moving and doing what when angels appeared to him. He had to go. Second, Joseph was a devout, devout man. We knew he was a man who obeyed God. He followed the Lord's leading and direction whenever the angel appeared. He packed up and moved. He didn't follow out his own marked out plan for his life. He followed God's plan. And when God spoke to him in a dream, he obeyed. They left. They moved. They did whatever he said to do. Amen. And so um, he was a man of faith. It takes faith to pack your bags and move off to another country on, the whim, on a whim. Boom, boom. Got to get out of here. Why? Because Herod was going to kill all the children under two years old. He could have made excuses to stay where it looked like it was going to prosper, but he followed God. He's a man of faith. Hallelujah. He was an example in his, to his father in spiritual duty. He set an example for his family. Going to the temple, attending the feast, um, we, in Luke, we find out he was, he was regularly in the temple. He was regularly going to the house of God. Luke 4.16 says this about Jesus. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Everybody say brought up. So where was Jesus? Jesus was not on a caravan. He was in Nazareth all those, miss, what they call the missing years. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now where did he get that? His daddy took him to church. Amen. Men, bring your kids to church. Amen. Be an example. Don't roll over and say, I worked hard this week. Come on now. Physical rest is not as important as spiritual rest. You receive spiritual rest in the house of God. Amen. Well, I am the house. Oh, don't start all that super spiritual junk with me. Yes, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, but the Bible says, Forsake not the assembling yourselves together as in the manner of some. Why? Because when we come together, we sharpen one another, we encourage one another, we strengthen one another. There is energy, there is spiritual energy, there is spiritual strength, there is spiritual nurturing that takes place between the saints. Ephesians chapter 4 says that each part supplies one to another. So don't start all that, I am the house of God, I don't need church. Hogwash. Paul did not go around to individuals and preach. He went to the synagogues, went to the churches and preached. When Jesus, when Jesus came, he went to where? The synagogue, which was his custom. He went, it's okay to have a custom of going to church. Besides Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, New Year's, Father's Day and Mother's Day. Grandparents' Day. Hallelujah. Brother Hagin said that when he was on the, when he was young, before he, before um, the, the, he, he was he, the uh, disease he had overtook him, and then God had to raise him up when he was six, about eighteen. Um, but at sixteen, he was bedridden. But before that, his his uh, aunt would take him to church, and he got to hear the pastor. In in three years, he got to hear the pastor of that church preach three six times. Because his, his aunt, being the superintendent of the youth Sunday school class, always stayed on Easter and Christmas services. She's the superintendent of the Sunday school for the youth division, and she stayed over for church on Easter and Christmas. And so he went to church with her for three years. He heard him six times. That's not how we do it. Be men. Be a godly example. Say, well, I'm not doing good. Come anyway. It won't hurt you. I can guarantee you coming to church won't hurt you. Amen. I've never seen anybody come to church and get shot by the pastor. We don't pass out Jim Jones Kool-Aid for communion. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. He went, so G Jesus had as a custom going to the synagogue. Why? Because his father led him there. His father was the head and brought him to church. Uh, so G Joseph was a loving man toward his wife, toward his son, even toward his whole family and other brothers and sisters. We know that, J that James and, um, and, 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 and possibly Jude were, we know for a fact James was a brother of Jesus, half-brother. And he's following, he's following the Lord, writing books in the Bible. And they even believe that possibly that Jude was um, one, one of his um, brothers. So, but, but you know, they're serving God. But you don't get that. You don't get that overnight. We train our children to serve the Lord. We bring them into the house of God. Amen. They need, we, need the, we need the church. You need the church. That's right. you, need, you need the spiritual strengthening that comes from others. Hallelujah. I can do just fine without it. No, you can't. None of us can. 
Not even me. We need one another. We need the strength that comes from being men and being around other men that are serving the Lord. I ain't talking about a bunch of mama's boys. That's right. I'm talking about men. Hello? And that, that, listen, ladies, if you're single and you don't have a father in the house, your kids need to be around men. So they don't become mama's boys. They need, they need the mentoring and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the example of godly men before them. Amen. Hallelujah. And Joseph was a wise man. He redeemed the time. Now, by all accounts, it seems that Joseph had a shortened life because uh, we see no record of him after the age of Jesus being 30. Um, or by the time Jesus was 30. And um, we don't have any record really after, after, after he was 12 years old. We don't have a record of anything that Joseph did. And, that, and at the cross, Jesus charged John to care for his mother. So it seems that Joseph was already gone at that point in time. But Joseph had used the time that he had and, and given had been given honorably and wisely. He provided for his family. He set an example for them that they would remember. They went to church. They were still going to church. That's right. He had raised them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Jesus was not the only child. Um, like we said, he had two other sons. At least we know that James and possibly Jude, uh, one of the right, both wrote books in the Bible, were brothers of Jesus. James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was the head of the church. He was not a pope. He was just the head of the church. Okay? So he raised his children in, in the way of the Lord and left them a legacy after his time. So let me ask you, are you really walking in the love of God as Joseph did? Are you walking in kindness and graciousness and mercy? Are you living devout, honorable, and godly lives before your kids uh, in obedience to God, faith towards God, faithful in your spiritual duties? Are you redeeming your time as, as, as um, Joseph did, encouraging your families at every opportunity, setting an example, providing for their needs? Um... A lot of times we talk to fathers in, in 1 Timothy 5, it says, But if any man does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith, and the faith is worse than an infidel. And we usually use this as money, but I'm going to say something here. There is more to providing for your house than money. Amen. Well, I went out and made some money. Well, la-di-da. What, what, what other example, what else are you providing for in your family? Are you providing affection in front of your children? Are you providing an example to your children? Are you providing godly counsel? Is there laughter and warmth and happiness in your house? Is there loving concern? You don't have to, you don't have to, I mean, listen, I understand. Our kids used to come in there crying, I got a boo-boo. You need a boo-boo stip? We, could, we, we had to call it a boo-boo stip. You know, we, do you want the one with the dinosaur on it or the one with Barney on it? Not Barney the dinosaur, Barney like Flintstone Barney. <laughs> And do you need Dino, Barney, or Fred? You know? We would, la we would laugh things off. They'd stop crying. A lot of times kids will stop crying if you just won't look, cry with them. Right. Okay? I, and I get that. that. I'm not talking about that. But are you concerned about their life? Are you, are, you, are you involved in their life? I've seen too many parents take their hands off at certain ages, let their kids go, and say, well, if they make it, they make it. That, that's, not, that's, not, that's not mentoring. That's not godly example. That's not the way you do things. That's right. Some will, some won't. You give everything you've got by the time you have them. As long as they're under my influence, I'm going to give them everything I got. Amen. Hello. Amen. I'm going to tell them when something doesn't look right. Amen. I'm going to tell them when it looks stupid. You're not going out of the house looking that way. They have to go and shake his head yes. He was going fishing yesterday. I said, boy, you have got it covered. He had on his retro mirrored aviators. <laughs> his real tree hat, his Wesleyan baseball uh, practice jersey, which is bright red, cowboy boots, and jeans, and his, and his surfer necklace. I said, you, you just got all the girls covered, don't you, boy? I mean, you got the country girls, you got the surfer girls, you got the, you got the redneck girls, you got the jock, girls like jocks. I mean, you just got it all covered in one package. It looks stupid, son. It don't match. But we let him go. But we finally just said, go ahead. Just go. You're just going to go fishing anyway. It'll keep the girls away. Hallelujah. Yeah. It'll keep the skanks out of the house and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> What, son? <laughs> he just don't get it sometimes. Mom and daddy do. You know? Um, we, we, are, we, are, we are guides to them. We're continuing to be guides to them. Now listen, it'll become, become a certain stage, a point in life where they won't be in our house. And we'll be a pool of wisdom for them. 
But as long as they're with us, I'm, we're guiding, we're teaching, we're training, we're telling them, no, yes, that you can't do that. No, don't do this. No, that's like, mm, 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 mm. think. Amen. Why? Because I love them and I'm concerned about them. Right. I don't want them to make foolish mistakes. Now, he's got this brand new guitar. He loves his brand new guitar. The, the, the one Starburst, when the other one's his older one, he's had about, about three years now. It's an Ibanez. His new one is an e, Epiphone uh, EJ400, 200. Elvis played it. That's one of the ones that Elvis used to play. Hallelujah. Just like that. So it was black. It wasn't Starburst, was it? Black AJ. Black AJ. Okay. It didn't have the cutout. And that little cutout. And it was rounded on that end. Now, his case hasn't come in. We're constantly going to be careful. Why? Because if he drops that guitar and scratches it up, he's going to be very upset. Amen. I know he'd be upset. So, think. How are you handling it? Where are you putting it? What are you doing with it? Well, you're nagging. No, I'm not nagging. We, we're concerned. Because a moment of not thinking. Well, you're going to be, you know, if you're going to be dumb, you've got to be tough. We, we use that sometimes. I, and, and we use it jokingly. But I'll be honest, that's really not the motto of our house. Hello? Now, I messed with Nathan after he, he broke his arm one time. and said, you're going to be dumb. You're going to have to be tough. He went rollerblading down a slide. Yeah. <laughs> and his friends were encouraging him. He called air. Woo! Praise God. Wow, look at that. Nathan, go and do it again. They weren't doing it. He was doing it. <laughs> Listen, when, you, when your friends are encouraging you to do something you not, shouldn't do, lesson number one, don't do it. Because they know it's stupid. They just want to see how dumb you are. <laughs> Nathan, second, the second time down, his rollerblade catches up. He goes up. Straight feet go up. Hand comes down. Breaks his arm. In three places. Baseball season's over. Yep, he's in a cast, can't go swimming, can't go to the pool, can't do nothing. But we'll look at that dumb cast all summer. Well, I did tell him afterwards, if you'll be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. Now, I didn't tell him that at the time. Right. Well, at the time, I was like, ah, oh, you didn't break your arm, grabbed his arm, and he passed out. All right. Oh, you did break your arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yeah, and it fell. All right. <laughs> now understand we had told him to always wear his wrist guards and his knee pads and his helmet on his rollerblades he slipped out and we didn't know it I'm going to the park well the park's the one house away so we thought okay go play with Blake until you get the park we didn't know he snuck the rollerblades over to slide on the slide I wouldn't have let him done it if he was if I'd known it I wouldn't have done it right. I didn't know as a father, you have to have concern about your children, even as they're getting older. Hello. Amen. Um, you know, some of y'all know Shannon was in a relationship. She was getting engaged. Things weren't working out. I told her it's better for you to break it off now than to visit me in prison. Some of y'all get that on the way home. <laughs> I was going to, you know, listen, my brother's already offered to come up with the truck and the shovel. Where, what woods do you want to take it to? <laughs> you know. I don't, I, hey, you figured this pastor out yet. He's talking about killing folk, burying them. <laughs> she's, she's my baby. That's my girl. Hello? She might be your wife, but she's going to be my daughter the rest of her life. Amen. I will hurt you. Amen. You ever hit her? Just don't call 911, call 1 800. Here come daddy. Amen. Hello? No, now let's listen, listen, seriously. Listen, you know, fathers have to have concern. You have to be concerned about your kids' well-being. What's going on in their life? You can't be this, I provide, I, I make money, I come home, you take care of it, woman. That's, that's, not, that's not fatherhood. Amen. I said, that's not fatherhood. Go brush your teeth, put your pajamas on, go to bed. You know what I used to do with my kids? Now, with the girls, for years, we would sit in bed. Jessie was horrible. She, she would, if, you, if you gave her a bottle of milk, you had to give her three bottles of milk to get her to sleep as a baby. She'd fall asleep on the third bottle. She would run in circles, and her ringlets would be soaking wet, and she'd finally pass out. Shannon would come in and go find a place in the corner and go to sleep. You wouldn't even know where she was. Where's Shannon? And you find her over some corner of the house somewhere asleep. 
But when it's time, when, you know, finally when the girls got, in their, got out of the cribs and they were in their own bed, I would lay down with it. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I was, I was a, my, my wife calls me Father Hen. When they all came home from the hospital, the bassinet was beside my side of the bed. And I would sleep with my hand on their back. They're breathing. They're breathing. They're breathing. They're breathing. They're breathing. They're breathing. It's a, okay, they're all right. <laughs> I slept every night. <laughs> and boy, it was tough to put them in that, in that nursery by themselves. I check on them 45 times a night. That's why my wife calls me Father Hen. But then I would slept with the girls, and they had this little uh, lullaby tape, you know. I see the moon, the moon sees me. It looks like the moon is smiling at me. And I, we would sing that in bed. Jesse would talk your ears off, and Shannon, you had to take her, I had to put her on my belly and take and, and, and put my hand on her butt, on her diaper, and shake her up and down. She had to have the motion. She still spins. That's the only way she, she goes, uh, 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 my arms would be getting cramps. <laughs> Just put them in there and shut the door and let them go to sleep. I couldn't do that. You know? I was a nurturing father. I was a caring father. I was with them. You know, Jane, Jane, when it came with Nathan, Nathan loved his mom. He loved to play with a pantyhose. He would rub, would rub the, the rub it between his finger. There's nothing weird about that. He, he, he liked the way it felt running between his fingers. You know, he, just, he would just play with him for hours. As a little bitty baby. <laughs> there is nothing sissy about him. Stand up, Nathan. <laughs> Eagle, stand up. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, for making that what it wasn't. <laughs> what? <clears throat> but his mama always got him to sleep. And, uh, but I, I, I've traveled... Hundreds and hundreds of miles to watch him play a ball game. That's right. Very few ball games I've missed in his life. Right. Very few. I was there. That was his number one cheerleader. I will be his number one cheerleader when he's playing in college. Amen. Hello. Now with college, it's probably be different. I won't be able to, but they travel all over the place. They go, they go all over different places in Virginia and all kinds of places they travel. I won't be able to make his everything. But when he's home, I'll be there. When he's close, I'll be there. Hello? Because I care about his life. Amen? Amen? I have concern about what's going on with him. They want to do things. They want to, they want to live in the dorm the first year. You live in the dorm the first year. Why? Because freshman year is the year that everybody acts like a bunch of idiots. They think they're, they're going to college we're going, and we're going to be idiots. You're not going to be an idiot. Hello. How do you know? Because I was one. So I'm not promoting doing everything I did. I'm not promoting it. That's good. Amen. Amen. Fathers have to be there to be for their kids. My, kid, my daughters didn't live on campus. Jesse only lived on campus one year, one time, and she, she's like, oh, God. <laughs> After Shetsy's experience, Shannon didn't want to live on campus. They just commuted. Like, you got to be kidding me. This is what you get when you live on campus? Forget that, Jack. Hello? Amen. Jesse missed out on a job because her roommate overheard somebody telling her about it. And that girl beat her to the place. Her roommate was supposed to be her friend. I tailed it down there and got her application first and got the job before Jessica could get down there. Yeah. That's your buddies. Yeah. But men, yeah, we're, we're to provide for our households, but it's more than money. We have to be examples. We're, we're mentors. How many, how many of you played sports and athletics at some point in time and you, you, you had coaches? They're your mentors. Our, our dads need to be our mentors. They are the life coach. Are you here? They are my our dad. life coach. I love my dad. A man in the most difficult circumstances had to be a father and a mother and work two jobs at the same time just to put food on the table. Yeah, we had, hot, we had boiled hot dogs and instant mashed potatoes. I still crave that occasionally. 
just because it's what I was eating as a kid. That's all, that's all we could get, a pack of weenies and some, some instant mashed potatoes. But it was food on the table. Hello? Doing what he had to do. Because he, he loved his kids. He loved his boys. We left one time in our Volkswagen Vanagon. Remember the old Volkswagen vans with the little crank up roofs on them? Which fit, he said $15 in his pocket. We went all the way to the, to the mountains of North Carolina through blowing rock and everything and back. He didn't know if he was going to make it or not. We were eating, you know, sandwiches and whatever. That's 1966 or 7. Maybe earlier, maybe 65. Doing what he could do to, to give his boys an opportunity. He remarried. My stepmother came in, you know, and, and, and was the mother to us. But I'm telling you, my dad held it together. And I'll never forget that example that I had from him during that time. He could have walked away and said, forget you, forget it all, and just given us up and let somebody take us. But he had two boys he had to take care of. He had to put himself out. He didn't get to go drink Bud Light and, and party hardy and, you know, hang out with his buddies and his pals. I get, I'm going to tell you what. You parents who think that every, every, every occasion in your life is to, go, is to pass, pawn your kids off of some babysitter while you go party. Shame on you. Facebook all your pictures of drinking your beer and partying up while your kid's stuck at some babysitter. You've got children that you can be an example to. you got children that you can cause to grow up and to honor you. I know some people, they would never take their kids on vacation. They'd always dump them off somewhere else. They won't take them on vacation. I, my wife and I have never gone, well listen, in, in, in the 31 years of marriage, but since our children, but Jesse was born in 1987, 6, She'll be 26 this year. Since she's been born, the furthest we've been away from home without our kids is Grandover. Are y'all here? Amen. No, I take that back. I take that back. When they got, when they got in the, when Nathan got about 15 or 16, we went to Biltmore one time without them. We went, we took them everywhere. Our anniversaries were usually spent with them. Sometimes we go one, we have, we go one night by ourselves to a hotel in Greensboro and spend it for our anniversary. We, we've done that a few times in the past as they got older, much older. But all those formative years, all those young years, all those years that we went on vacation, they went with us. We didn't pile out with our buddies and let, drop our kids off. Why? I have a responsibility to raise my children up. Now, my kids were brought up camping, tent camping, pop-up camping. Now we got a, we got a travel trailer. But me and Nathan, now our thing now is now that the girls have gotten older and they sometimes their mom and them will go do stuff together. Me and Nathan go over to Cherokee and throw a tent on the ground. We sleep. We, we throw blow up our air mattress. We cook over the fire mm -hmm. and uh, and tube down the uh, Okafenoki, huh? Okanolufti. Akana Lufti, thank you there, Cherokee son. Yeah, it's, it's one of those funny Indian name rivers. <coughs> and I'm doing, we're doing everything we can as a family and in, in, in different parts of the family and during the time we have them because our years are shortened as to when we're going to be able to do all this. But see, my, my dad and my family took us camping. And we spent that family time together. I'm telling you, there's things you can do together as a family. Now, my kids all love the outdoors. They all like to go camping. They all dream about hiking and trails and waterfalls and, you know, uh, you build that type of image into your children by being godly parents. As a godly father, you have a responsibility. Now, our youth group has gone camping. It, what, last year? Was it last year? Last year, yeah. Yeah. We're trying to do some more things with our youth as the kids get older to help have that mentoring time. That's not just by mistake. That's, that's a mentoring time. Right. So they can be taught things by godly men and women. Amen? Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for our time together. Thank you for our fathers. Thank you that our fathers have been challenged today. I, I ask that no condemnation come out of this message, but a challenge. To those who have not been fulfilling their duties, Lord, stir them up. Open their eyes to the profitability for their families, for their kids, of them stepping up to the plate and being the example they need to be. 
for the men in our church to be mentors and godly examples to the fatherless in our church. To be examples to them of men who can serve the Lord and walk before the Lord uprightly. And train them up in the things of God by being mentors for them. Lord, we thank you for that. Bless every household. Bless them in every arena. Speak to their hearts, Father. As the Father of fathers, speak to the men's hearts. And let them see how good it can be for their kids' futures for them to step up and be like Joseph. A loving man, a devout man, a wise man. And I thank you that it's accomplished in their lives in Jesus' name. Amen.